Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see everybody today. Good to see several back with us that have not been able to be here for a while. Glad that you're doing better and able to be here. It's always good to see all of your smiling faces. So glad that you're doing well. This morning, we are continuing our study through the book of Ephesians. And you may remember in the first half of the book of Ephesians, Paul has been telling us about some general plans, some purposes, and the work that God is fulfilling through the church. As well, we noted on a couple of occasions that in the church, we are to be a visible display to the world of the wisdom, the love, the goodness, and the faithfulness of God. When the world sees children of God, it should be a testimony of those things to those who are in the world. God wants us, as His children, to live lives that He can be proud of. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 3 and verse 10, it says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Folks, simply put, we are to be a demonstration of how wise God is. Because you think about this with me for just a moment. For even after we had rejected God, had rebelled against His will, and had begun worshiping the creation rather than the Creator, God was able to get us back. We were broken into many different nations We were all broken people, broken by the effects of sin, all lost in sin. But God had a plan in place. And that plan He brought about through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He did this in such an unusual way. No one would ever imagine that the way that God would bring about the salvation of the world was through His Son dying on a cross. That was so far beyond the comprehension of mankind of why that would be the way. It was kind of like God won a fight with both hands tied behind His back. But He still won the fight. And so now as we come into the second half of the book of Ephesians... We're now going to see Paul presenting some ways that we maintain that unity. That unity that the death of Christ facilitated. But also he's going to show us some ways that we are to be reflecting the wisdom of God to the world. We've already talked about some of those. We do this by putting off our old ways. We turn away from the ways of the world. We put on a new man who is patterned after the example of Christ. We put on love and we put on the character of Christ. We become more Christ-like each and every day as we strive to allow the Word of God to transform our lives. But also, we maintain that unity and we reflect the wisdom of God by refusing to tolerate divisiveness. We strive for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We strive to be that united image. But then we come to our lesson text today. There in Ephesians chapter 5. And beginning in verses 15 through 18, we find Paul going to give us even more information on how to be a demonstration of God's wisdom to the world. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So notice in in these verses that Paul is giving us three pairs of behaviors. Three of those negative, and three of those positive. He tells us not to be unwise, there's the negative, But be wise, there's the positive. He tells us not to be foolish, there's the negative. 
but to understand the will of God. There's the positive. And then don't be full of wine, which clouds and dulls the mind and judgment. That's the negative. But be filled with the Spirit. There's the positive. But I want you to notice also in this, this is not a suggestion. In fact, this is something that comes with a sense of urgency. This is something that we are to be striving for right now, not something that we're looking to the future saying, yeah, one of these days I'll get to that point. No, these are things we are to be doing now. And notice why he says that there's this sense of urgency. It's because the days are evil. Therefore, he says, we are to be making the best use of our time. Doing the best that we can to fulfill these things. Because the days are evil. But why are the days evil? Well, if we back up to Ephesians 2.2, 2, you may remember the discussion that we had here. We're told that the days are evil because they are being ruled by the prince of the power of the air. This is in reference to Satan. Paul then expands upon this in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 4, a passage that I'm sure is familiar to many of you, where he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so with all of this in mind, Paul is telling us, since this is the way that the world is, you need to be making the best use of the time that you have. We need to be wise, understanding the will of God. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit's influence. We understand that that influence comes through the Word. Hence, we talk about our lives being transformed by the Word of God. And the reason there is an urgency is because these are the last days. This is the last dispensation of time that there is ever going to be before Christ comes again. This Christian age is it. When the Christian age comes to an end, Jesus is going to come again. And all will go and stand before Him in judgment. Those who have lived faithful lives will receive that heavenly home. Those who have not will be condemned to eternity in hell. So then, what are we supposed to do as we await that time? What are we as children of God supposed to engage in while we wait on Jesus to come again? Well, notice Paul tells us we're to sing. We're to sing. Notice Ephesians 5, verses 19 and 20. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, from the outset, that might sound a little odd to you. The world around us is so evil. There's so much wickedness going on. We're supposed to be a display of the wisdom of God. And Paul tells us that in order to do that, we're to sing. If we want to be wise... If we want to be understanding of the will of God, if we want to be full of the Spirit, then singing is probably not the first thing that comes to mind. Most people would probably think, well, we need to amass some more knowledge. We need to get into the book. We need to spend time studying God's Word and applying those things to our life. So why is it? That as Paul begins this conversation of ways that we maintain this unity, we continue to show forth the wisdom of God, why does he command us to sing in order to do that? How does singing help us to walk in wisdom during these last days? Now those are good questions, aren't they? Those are questions that we need to consider. 
Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why does God want us to sing? Why does God command us to sing? Notice what the passage says. Notice He is not saying that you are to speak to one another, to say to one another good, true, and uplifting things. Well, granted, we are to do that. There's other passages of Scripture that talk about our speech, our communication. Nor is He suggesting to us that this is a good thing to do, but leaving it up to us to decide if we're going to do it or not. No, He commands us to sing. For those of us here who have been raised around religious influences, those who were raised in Christian homes, those who were raised attending worship services from the youngest of age, it's very easy for us to take singing for granted, isn't it? Because it's something that we've always done. We may be singing songs that we've sung hundreds of times. It's just something that we've always done, so we continue to do it. You know, sadly, that tends to be the answer that so many people in the religious world gives when they're asked why they do the things that they do. Well, it's just tradition. That's what we've always done. But what would you say to a visitor or to a young Christian, one that does not have that type of background, When they say, why do we have to sing? Why is everybody singing together? That's a good question. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Singing is often described as something that we give to God as a part of our worship. And whenever you look at what Paul tells us here in Ephesians 5.19... Notice he gives us a list of three different types of what we might refer to just generally as songs. He mentions psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Well, the first in that group are psalms, what is generally called the hymn book of Israel. Well, among those 150 psalms, we find many of those psalms that have no other purpose than to express praise to God. If we were to pick up the hymn book that we use here at Pyburn Street, I would dare say that there are probably hundreds of songs that express praise to God in the songs that we sing. You know, an example from the psalm, Psalm 150, verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. You read down through this psalm, what's the purpose? To praise God. Is it not normal for us to praise the things that we truly love? Yes. You stop and you think with me for just a moment. If you go to a restaurant and you are served a wonderful meal, are you going to tell anybody about that? Probably so. You're going to express that to the server. You might even tell that to the manager of the restaurant. Then you're going to tell your friends about it. You know, we went over here and we had a wonderful meal the other night. You really need to go try this place out. We praise those things that are good. Parents, if our children do something good, do we keep our mouths shut? No. We want to tell people about it, don't we? Why? Because we're proud of them for what they've accomplished. Praise has been defined as the completion of our enjoyment. And I like that definition. The completion of our enjoyment. And folks, the point is, if we really love something, we're going to praise it. If we really love it, we cannot help but sing its praises. So coming back to the point that we're discussing this morning, if we truly love God if we truly recognize His greatness, then folks, we cannot help but sing praises to God. But also, 
We need to recognize that by singing praises of God, we are stopping ourselves from putting something else in that place of praise. We are stopping ourselves from putting some type of idol or some type of worldly influence in that place of prominence in our life. Because we recognize with every fiber of our being that we're going to sing of the glory of God. But praising God is not the only thing that we are supposed to do with our singing. If we look at this passage again, Ephesians 5 and verse 19, notice how it starts. Speaking to one another. What that means is that our singing is not to be directed just to God. Singing to one another. Speaking to one another. What this means is that we are to be singing for the benefit of one another. No, we are not singing for the entertainment of one another. We are not to be singing for the um, auditory pleasure of one another, meaning we don't have to have the greatest voice in the world. But we are to be singing for the benefit of one another. Because we recognize... That singing is what is going to help us to walk in wisdom. Notice God does not instruct us to sing for His benefit. You look at the the passages in the New Testament where it talks about Christians coming together and singing in worship. Notice God never says, nor these inspired writers ever say, that we are to be singing to God. We are singing for one another's benefit. Because when it comes down to it, yes, our worship is directed to our Heavenly Father, but we need the effects of worship more than God does. God does not need our worship. He desires our worship. We need the effects of that worship. So this morning, what I want to talk about just briefly, what are the benefits of singing? We may not have ever thought about that before. What are the benefits? Well, I've already mentioned one of those. It helps us to walk in wisdom. We need to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs because they help us to walk uprightly. I want you to go with me back into the Old Testament for just a moment. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, the children of Israel have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They have now come back to the banks of the Jordan. They are about to cross over and begin conquering the land of Canaan. But God has a conversation with Moses. He tells Moses, Moses, you're not going to be their leader any longer. You're going to go up on the mountain. You're going to die. And when these people go into the land, they're going to rebel. They're going to turn away from me. So let's notice these words. Deuteronomy 31, verses 16 through 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, meaning you will die. And this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all the evil which they have done, and that they have turned to other gods." Simply put, Israel was about to be without their leader. This man who had guided them through these years in the wilderness, who has now led them to the Jordan, this one that has kept them close to God, he's no longer going to be there. And God says they're going to go into this land and they're going to fall prey to worldly influences. They're going to go, they're going to fall in with these other nations. They're going to begin worshiping those false gods. They're going to adopt some of their beliefs and their customs. 
He said, and in those days, I'm going to have to turn my back on them. Because if they are not serving me, if they're not serving God, then they're not going to receive the blessings of God. And he says that his judgment was going to come upon them. But I want you to notice what he goes on to say after this. He gives them a solution. What they can do to avoid this, to stay out of this kind of predicament, to avoid the judgment of God. So I want you to notice the tool that he gives them. Look at verse 19. Now therefore, remember he's speaking to Moses. Now therefore, write down this song for yourselves. And teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And then skip down to verse 21. Then it shall be when many evils and troubles have come upon them that this song will testify against them as a witness. For it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behavior today even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to them. What Moses is being told, he says, you go out, you teach this song to the children of Israel. He gave them these words. He said, and as long as they keep this song in their minds, then they will avoid these things that come their way. As long as they remember the things that God has done for them. And what were they given in order to remember that? A song to sing. As long as they remember this, then God will be on their side. Now I want you to ask yourself a question. How many songs live in the recesses of your mind? You stop and you think about that. How many songs are there floating around in your mind right now? Hundreds? Thousands? How many of us if we did not have a hymn book, would know enough hymns that we could worship this morning just from memory. Many of us. How many of us could sing those songs and never miss a word? A lot of us. Now we might, we might miss something here or there, but for the most part, we know it. We know those things. But then... Ask yourself this question. How many of those songs that you know the words to are speaking out against things that you continue to allow to be wrong in your life? Things that you know, things that you sing, things that you recognize, but they are things that are there that aid you when you face temptation. They are things that you use in times of struggle. When we think about this song that God gave to Israel, its purpose was to accomplish a number of things. It was to teach them of God's love, what He had done for them. It was to condemn them for the false gods that they were practicing or that they were bowing down to. But also, and here is something that I want us to keep in mind when we think about this this morning. The reason this song was given to them as well was because as they walked along, going through life, facing difficulty, wondering what to do, that song would be in their mind. Those words would be there to remind them of what God expects. How many songs do that for us? How easy is it to commit a sin? With the words, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, but he died alone for you and me. How easy is it to sin with those words in your mind? How easy is it to see someone that we need to share the gospel with? And we start to pass them by and we think, you never mentioned him to me. You helped me, not the light to see. You met me day by day and knew I was astray. But you never mentioned him to me. How easy is it to pass that person by with those words in your mind? 
Folks, all of this supports what Paul said in Colossians 3.16, to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Our singing, it it gives us an ever-present reminder of God's Word. The things that we sing either come directly from the Word of God or they are teaching principles that come from the Word of God. It allows those things to stick in our minds and come out when we need them the most. But secondly, there's another benefit to singing. Did you know that singing is therapeutic? Singing does a lot to help us, to encourage us, to give us strength to face the difficulties of life. Remember, most of the songs that we sing follow some type of poetic structure. There's a beautiful flow to those words. They're not just flat statements. But as one poet put it, hymns put the best words in the best order. I think that's a good way of thinking about that. Back in 2021, a neuroscientist by the name of Richard Seema, he engaged in a study that pertained to the health benefits of singing and poetry. And he found some pretty interesting things. He found that hospitalized children who either read or write poetry and who listen to and sing songs have a great reduction in fear, sadness, anger, worry, and fatigue, and generally they go home quicker. He also found that cancer patients generally have an improved emotional resilience, an alleviation of anxiety levels, and an improved quality of life if they spend time every day in song. Another study that was published in 2019 found that music and especially singing helps healthcare workers. And this was a study that was done right in the the height of the pandemic. It found that those healthcare workers that generally listen to music through the day or uh, would, would hum or would have some type of a song that they would sing, that generally they had a more upbeat attitude about them. We see even today that there are many doctor's offices that will have soft music playing in the background. Uh, The study found that there were many surgeons that would play music in the operating room. That way it would help them to, to focus on the tasks at hand because it alleviated many of those stressors. I'm sure there's probably many of us that from time to time when we lie down to go to bed at night, we turn music on to help us relax. Many people will do that. You know, Psalm 77 verses 4 through 6 even talks about that. It says, You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. How many times do we lie in bed awake at night worrying about things that we can't change? Thinking about things from the past that continue to worry us. The psalmist said, Yeah, I I would do that. But then listen to this. But I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent speech. He said, but I sing. I sing. And it relaxes me. It brings me to a sense of peace. It brings comfort to my spirit. But also keep in mind that the songs that we sing are not just meant to pep us up. They are not just meant to cater to one emotion. You go back and you look at the Psalms and over half of those 150 Psalms are what we would call today sad songs. They talk about sad situations. They are expressions of emotion. You know, sometimes I think we lose sight 
of the wide array of emotions that we can and should feel in our worship to God. Yes, there should be joy. There should be excitement when we're here. But how can we not be moved to feel other emotions when we think about the Lord's Supper? When we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, you think about the songs that we often sing to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. You know, we generally would not refer to them as happy, upbeat songs. They are songs that get us into the frame of mind. That cater to an emotional response that is proper for that. But you know, we can turn even in our book. And we can find songs that deal with things like depression and anger and doubt and fear. And we find that that is all proper. Oftentimes, those are feelings that we have a hard time expressing. We may not know how to explain it. We may not know how to communicate that to one another. But those songs provide us with an outlet to be able to do that. A way to express the things that we feel. We have songs for every possible emotion. I'll give you an example from my own life. Something that I've done, I guess, probably since around my college years, maybe a little bit, a little bit younger. Any time that I face a very stressful situation or maybe a situation where there's some fear... There's one certain song that always comes into my head. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I cannot try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need Thy strength to lean myself upon. And that's just an example from my life. There may be things in your life that are the same way. You face certain things and there's things that have always been there in your mind that bring you comfort, that give you strength, that provide you with that encouragement that you need. They help us through. But then lastly, and we'll go through this one very quickly. We find that singing is not to be something that is just ritual. It is not to be something that we just do without giving any thought or any emotion to it. Because our singing is to engage both the head and the heart. Our singing is to engage our mind, but also our emotional state. What that means is that we should find true joy. Because true joy comes from the head and the heart. That is a way that God engages both of those things in our life as we come to worship Him. Notice the words of Psalm 27 and verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Now, listen to what the psalmist is saying in this passage. The psalmist is talking about the joy that he finds in reflecting upon God. Reflecting upon the blessings of God, the ability to do so while worshiping God in song should stir up great joy in our hearts. How is it? Let me ask you this question. How is it even possible for us to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ to join our voices together and sing how beautiful heaven must be and it not bring joy to our hearts? Or when we all get to heaven and and the mental images that come to our mind as we sing these things, how does that not encourage us? Or we think about just the, 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 the encouragement that we receive when we sing songs like, Our God, He is alive. Do we not feel a stirring of the emotions when we sing songs like that? Absolutely. But with all this being said, I know that there are some Christians, even some members of this congregation, who do not sing. 
They don't like to sing. They claim they cannot sing. They'll skip out on singing nights. And after the things we've discussed this morning, I can't help but wonder why. Why? When we think about the benefits that come from singing praises to God, the benefits that come from joining our voices together in song with our brothers and sisters, speaking to one another in these powerful ways, how could we not want to give that our best effort? No, that doesn't mean that we have to have a great voice. No, it doesn't mean that we even have to have a strong, loud voice. But God does expect us to sing. He commands us to sing. And just as we would put forth our best in any other act of worship that we engage in, if we truly love God, if we truly recognize His greatness, then we cannot help but lift our voices in song to Him. Now this morning, as we bring this lesson to a close, I want to ask you all to stop and examine yourself and ask yourself if you're living the kind of life that God wants you to live. Are there things in your life that you know are contrary to the will of God, but you have, to this point, refused to turn loose of those things? You've continued to engage in sin. You've continued to rebel against God. Then I encourage you this morning, turn away from those things. Do not continue to live your life this way. If you're a child of God, but those sins are still in your life, repent of those things. Turn away from it come to a position of faithful service. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, then we encourage you this morning, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, to repent of your sins. Come forward, confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. And be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Be raised to walk in newness of life and leave this place today rejoicing that you're in a right relationship with God. This morning, if you examine yourself, you need to respond to the Lord's invitation. Please come while we stand and sing.